It used to be that laid-back people were respected. A laid-back person is relaxed and comfortable with life, has few anxieties and says no worries rather a lot. But precious few of these characters remain, and this is not without reason. In today's market-driven, aspirational world, there is not really much call for such persons, except for at the odd barbecue and in TV shows about rural life written by city dwellers. In fact, if you are a laid-back sort, this is probably the real reason why you are such a failure. This character trait of yours is actually holding you back. As such, it is an impediment and needs to be eradicated. I will show you how. The first thing to observe is that your laid-backness is the result of a physical deformity. Very few people realise this, but it's true. Laid-backness as a personality trait has been correlated with an excess of bone material in the feet. In particular, those who are laid-back tend to have hypertrophy of the balls of their feet. What this means is that such people have a natural tendency to overbalance backwards slightly. This makes them appear relaxed, in some cases diffident, and in extreme cases almost entirely disconnected from other people. This deformity requires correction, and you can do this in one of two ways. The first way. Get yourself a file. Not any file will do. You'll need a file designed to file down horse's hooves. It may take some time to track down one of these, but be persistent. Once you have the file, you should start working on the balls of your feet. Don't worry about filing away your skin and flesh. It will grow back. Keep going until the deformity is corrected. If you are squeamish, you may take a couple of paracetamol tablets in advance of this procedure. The second way. Amputate some of your toes. For the normal person, toes are useful balancing devices. Were the average person to amputate some of his or her toes, then he or she would be liable to topple forward. But for the laid-back person, Amputation of the toes will correct the existing imbalance, and after this procedure, the formerly laid-back person will adopt a proper vertical posture. Should you remove too many toes, you may acquire a slight forward lean. But don't be too concerned. A slight forward lean is actually very desirable in the current interpersonal climate. It will make you appear more engaging, interested and enthusiastic and no one will ever mistake you for being laid back. Understood? Good. Now, before you do anything else, I'd like you to pause for a moment. If you are laid back, were you just about to perform one of these procedures? And if you are not laid back, were you just about to tell all of your laid-back friends to perform one of these procedures? No? That's good. You see, this is a test and also a warning. I will always give you sincere and helpful advice, but there are plenty of charlatans out there. There are also many well-intentioned but misguided advice givers. I just want to make sure that you are listening to advice with your critical faculties engaged. What I was suggesting that you do is tantamount to self-mutilation. If someone tells you that you ought to amputate or modify parts of your own body, make sure you think long and hard about that advice before going through with it. Think to yourself, does this advice make sense? Is it really the best way of solving my problem? Having posed these questions, if you are still undecided, you may find it helpful to ask, what would Hognogger do in this situation? Now, although the remedies for laid-backness that I suggested were fabricated, and possibly even dangerous, I should really let you know of the proper treatment for this condition. 
In order to restore proper balance, fusing a number of vertebrae in the lumbar region of the back is required. If any among you are suffering from this malady of laid backness, I suggest you consult your regular general practitioner and ask for a referral. A back specialist is most likely to be able to advise you on the various fusion procedures available and help you to select the one which best suits your particular circumstances. Send me a letter and I will make you feel much better. Today, I've plucked three letters from my quivering mail sack. Dear Hognogger, I have been following your new podcast with some interest and I'm impressed by how much good sense you talk. I'm sick of having to buy cheese graters every decade or so. In search of an eternal cheese grater, I've been buying graters and pitting them against each other in gladiatorial grater grinding contests. It stands to reason that if I keep doing this, I must one day come across the perfect grater that will be indestructible. Once I find this grater, I'll keep it for the rest of my life. So far, all that has come of this enterprise is a pile of ruined graters. Am I on the right track? Best wishes, Jennifer. Jennifer, I can confirm that you are definitely on the right track. Unless, that is, you are over 75 years old, in which case you'll probably die soon anyway and are wasting your time, your precious time. I mention this because sometimes, when people reach an advanced age, instead of dealing with their fears of mortality, they project these fears onto other features of their environment. For some, the wish that life would go on forever translates into a search for an immortal pet. For others, it's a car that will never break down. I've even heard of cases where elderly people have filed patent after patent for different perpetual motion machines. If you recognise yourself in any of these examples, get in touch again and we will work through your problems together. But if you're not in your twilight years, it's all fine and I heartily recommend that you carry on with your search. A little word of advice. The golden age for durable cheese graters was from the late 19th to early 20th centuries, before planned obsolescence became standard manufacturing practice. Perform a Google search for the golden age of cheese graters for more information. And I wish you well. Next, we have an unexploded bomb from Eric. Dear Hognogger, I'd like to take you seriously, but I find it hard to believe that you are hundreds of years old and that Flinky is a gentleman of well over 2,000 years. Everyone knows that people don't live that long. No, I've been thinking carefully about this and I've done my research too. I submit that you are a giant tortoise. These creatures are well known to have long lifespans. Flinky is much older than the oldest giant tortoise and posed a more difficult problem, but eventually I tracked him down. He is a two and a half thousand year old yew tree currently residing in Raysbury in the United Kingdom. Yours sincerely, Eric. Hello, Eric. I'm sorry to say that since giant tortoises live for a few hundred years at most, I am not a giant tortoise. I have no further comment to make about your letter, except that you might try looking for a second tree in Raysbury. Our final letter for today comes from Sam, who is working towards a media career. Sam writes, Dear Hognogger, I'm in my second year of a journalism degree. I've always wanted to be on TV and maybe even to become a minor celebrity. It really seemed like everything was going to plan. But yesterday, I received my grade for an important piece of work. As usual, 
I completed the assignment by cutting and pasting bits and pieces of information from the internet into a single document, while adding a few sentences here and there to tie things together. Quite nicely, I thought. Imagine my distress when I discovered that the assignment was awarded a fail grade and I was accused of plagiarism. It feels like my heart has been ripped out. I'm probably going to fail the whole year because of this. I just don't understand how they can do this to me. Sam Sam, I sense that you are looking for personal validation and expressions of sympathy. Well, I can understand why you feel as you do, and I sympathise, but I'm afraid I have to break it to you. The teaching staff did have a very good reason for failing your assignment. First, though, I'd like to offer you some reassurance. It's just possible that you feel like you've been shamed, that accusations of plagiarism are serious and imply some sort of moral failing on your part. And if you were a mathematics student trying to claim that you invented calculus or even non-Euclidean geometry, you'd be right. Or, if you were a history student reproducing chunks of Thomas Paine's common sense and passing them off as your own, you'd be right. But remember, you are doing a journalism degree. This means that your teachers don't consider your transgression to be an ethical one. They're not accusing you of having some horrid character flaw. No. They just think that you handed in some shoddy work. Let me explain. By the second year of your journalism degree, you should be making strides towards becoming an unobtrusive plagiarizer. Your teaching staff are likely to make allowances in your first year of study, but the fact that you have been accused of plagiarism now, in your second year, indicates that you have made almost no progress at all and that they are very worried about letting you loose on an unsuspecting public. Unfortunately, your teachers must be very careful to avoid creating the impression that they are encouraging plagiarism. Plagiarism is still considered a serious matter by most universities and until this changes, they will have to resort to indirect methods of teaching you what you need to know, such as setting ridiculously long assignments that cannot be done in the allotted time frames without resort to plagiarism, and letting you know that you are an incompetent plagiarizer by accusing you of plagiarism. So don't worry. This accusation is just their way of letting you know that your work needs to improve. Nothing more. Why is it important for your journalistic career that you be a good plagiarizer? Let's suppose you end up working for a newspaper. These days you'll probably be expected to be across several different areas of reporting, to run a Twitter feed, design web material and more. Basically you'll be pumping nugget day and night. The thing is, there's not really much point having journalists create content. This content has already been provided by public relations people. Frankly, it's a waste of time and human resources to duplicate this work. And since there are now five public relations people for every journalist, it stands to reason that public relations people should be producing most of the content you use. What this means is that to be successful in the newsroom, you'll need to be good at plagiarising. Don't believe me? In 2013, Veek Media conducted a survey of public relations people and journalists. The findings from this survey were presented as PR perceptions versus media realities. The main purpose of this research is to help public relations people do better at getting the sort of media coverage they'd like for their campaigns. One of the pet peeves of journalists 
as reported in this survey, is being presented with content by PR people that they have to edit. A great many journalists are not happy if they go to a company's website and find that the company's press release material isn't suitable to be inserted verbatim into their news reports. Here is Mark Kirby via the Public Relations Institute of Australia podcast to explain this point. More and more people uh, respect the idea that the journalists, instead of working with a, with a team of 10, they're now working with a team of one and they're, they're using that information, copy and paste, copy and paste. There was actually quite a few comments which surprised me that, that said, if you if it's badly written and I have to rewrite a release, it doesn't get a run. I want to be able to copy and paste and put it straight in. Being a good plagiarist really is a skill that you need to work on a bit before you can start reaping the rewards. It's not just copying and pasting stuff, it's using your discretion. You'll need to be able to recognise when material provided by public relations people is okay to be printed as is, and when it requires editing. If the PR people are doing their jobs properly, you should be able to copy and paste, but you can't rely on this. Also, you'll sometimes be cutting and pasting material from multiple sources into the one article. In these cases, you'll need to add whatever connective material is required to knit the stuff you've copied and pasted together into a coherent whole. So, even though the PR people will be providing the bricks, you, as the journalist, still need to provide the mortar. You clearly lack these skills. What you have to do is convince your teachers that you have what it takes to cobble together material from different sources so that it appears to be nice and seamless, rather than looking like the monstrosity it really is. It's likely that you have very little talent for plagiarism yourself, so I'd say your best bet is to get some personal coaching and do your best to scrape through with the written work required for the rest of your degree. Other than that, I'd say you are on the right path. Continue to focus on your grooming and perhaps your elocution while carrying on with your party-based life. With determination and a little luck, you'll be a television presenter and you'll get to read out other people's plagiarism without having to contribute any of your own. And that's all we have for you today. As always, send me a letter at hognogger at gmail.com and until next time, go derivatively. Nothing seems worthwhile Hog-nogger Hog-nogger